Shoulder Conditions The human shoulder is made up of three bones, the clavicle or collarbone, the scapula or the shoulder blade, and the humerus or the upper arm bone, as well as associated muscles, ligaments, and tendons. The shoulder must be mobile enough for the wide range of actions of the arms and hands, but also stable enough to allow for actions such as lifting, pushing, and pulling. The compromise between mobility and stability results in a large number of shoulder problems not faced by other joints such as the hip. Shoulder conditions to be discussed include fractures of the humerus, clavicle, and scapula, sternoclavicular joint sprains, acromioclavicular joint sprains, glenohumeral joint sprains, dislocations and subluxations, glenohumeral joint instability, glenoid labrum tears, shoulder impingement syndrome, rotator cuff strain, biceps, which includes bicipital tendonitis and rupture, thoracic outlet syndrome, and scapular winging. A humerus fracture is a bone fracture of the upper arm. Fractures of the humerus may be classified by the location and divided into fractures of the upper end, the shaft, or the lower end. 80% of proximal humerus fractures are non-displaced or minimally displaced and therefore can be properly managed non-operatively. Associated injuries are common in patients with osteoporosis. Distal humeral fractures are associated with proximal forearm fractures. Rarely, vascular or nerve injuries are associated with humeral fractures. Radial nerve palsy is associated with fractures of the shaft of the humerus and is the most common nerve lesion complicating fractures of long bones. Humeral fractures may occur in a number of ways. From a direct blow, this can happen during a fall, landing directly on the elbow, or being struck by a hard object, such as a baseball bat, car dashboard, or during a crash. An indirect fracture, this can happen during a fall if a person lands on his or her outstretched arm with the elbow locked straight. The ulna is driven into the distal humerus, causing it to break. Distal humeral fractures can be very painful and may prevent the patient from moving his or her elbow. Additional symptoms include swelling, bruising, pain or tenderness to the touch, stiffness, feeling of instability, or feeling like my elbow wants to pop out, or pieces of the bone may be stuck out of the skin, but this is rare. Management of humeral fractures should include checking the distal pulse, immobilizing and treating the patient for shock, activation of EMS, and in young patients, suspect an epiphyseal fracture, which occurs at the growth plate. A clavicle fracture is a bone fracture in the clavicle or collarbone. It is most often caused by falling onto an outstretched hand, also known as FUSH. FUSH stands for falling on an outstretched hand, or fall on the shoulder, or a direct blow to the clavicle. Many research projects are underway regarding the medical healing process of clavicular fractures. Signs and symptoms include pain, particularly with upper extremity movement or on the front part of the chest, swelling, often after the swelling has subsided, the fracture can be felt through the skin, sharp pain when any movement is made, referred pain, which is dull to extreme ache in and around the clavicle area, including surrounding muscles, possible nausea, dizziness, and or spotty vision due to extreme pain. Management of clavicular fractures should include checking the distal pulse, immobilizing and treating the patient for shock, activation of emergency medical services. Since a clavicular fracture is not treated surgically in most cases, a figure eight clavicular strap brace may be used to support, such as the picture on the slide. The sternoclavicular joint is the only bony connection between the upper limb and the rest of the skeleton, providing stability to the front of the chest and shoulder and allowing for some shoulder movement. During certain activities, stretching or compression forces are placed on the sternoclavicular joint. When these forces are excessive and beyond what the normal joint can withstand, tearing of the ligaments and connective tissue of the joint may occur. This is a condition known as a sternoclavicular joint sprain. A sternoclavicular joint sprain can range from a small sprain resulting in minimal pain and allowing ongoing activity to a severe sprain resulting in significant pain, deformity, and disability. A sternoclavicular joint sprain typically occurs due to a specific incident such as a direct blow to the point of the shoulder or the top of the chest. This commonly occurs in motor vehicle accidents, in contact sports typically due to a collision with another player, or falling onto an outstretched limb. Patients with this condition typically experience a sudden onset pain at the time of injury and at the top of the chest, 
Pain may increase with activities involving laying on the affected side, moving the arm across the body, overhead arm movements, or performing heavy lifting, pushing or pulling with the affected arm. Pain may also occur during coughing or sneezing. In minor cases of sternoclavicular joint sprain, patients may be able to continue activity only to experience an increase in pain, swelling, and stiffness in the upper chest and shoulder after activity with rest, particularly first thing in the morning. In more severe cases, pain may prevent the patient from continuing activity and causing them to cradle the arm. Patients may also experience a rapid onset of swelling and may notice a visible deformity or bump at the front of their chest at the tip of the collarbone sticking out. Patients with this condition may also experience bruising, weakness, and pain on firmly touching the affected sternoclavicular joint. If you suspect an SC joint sprain, treat the joint with price and refer the patient. If it is a joint sprain with posterior displacement, this is considered a medical emergency and should be treated immediately. The human shoulder joint is more mobile than any other joint in the body. This flexibility makes it very susceptible to instability and injury. A separated shoulder, sometimes referred to as a shoulder sprain or a chromioclavicular joint separation, occurs when the ligaments that hold the collarbone to the shoulder blade are injured or separated. The severity of AC joint separation can range from mild to severe. In mild cases, the ligaments are stretched. However, in severe cases, the ligaments are completely torn. There are a number of common causes for AC separation injuries. These include a fall directly on the shoulder, a blow to the shoulder blade, car accidents, and sports injuries, most common in contact sports such as football, hockey, and rugby. Signs and symptoms of shoulder separation may include pain at the very top of the shoulder while sleeping or making overhead movements, a deformity or bump over the top of the shoulder, shoulder or arm weakness or instability, limited shoulder mobility, bruising and or swelling, the shoulder may appear to hang lower than normal, and a popping sound may be heard when moving the joint. There are various treatments for shoulder separation ranging from surgical to conservative treatments. Most people recover from AC joint separation in about 2 to 12 weeks without the need of surgery. The piano key sign is a key clinical feature of an AC joint separation. The piano key sign test is also known as a spring test. During the test, the patient is sitting with the involved arm relaxed at the side. The examiner applies pressure to the patient's distal clavicle in an inferior direction. A positive test occurs with depression of the clavicle when pressure is applied and elevation of the clavicle when pressure is released, much like a piano key does when pressed. Acromioclavicular joint injuries are classified most commonly using the sixth grade system described by Rockwood in 1998. This classification system evaluates not only the acromioclavicular joint itself, but also the coracoclavicular ligament, the deltoid, and the trapezius muscle, as well as the direction of dislocation of the clavicle with respect to the acromion. Within this system, type 1 through 3 are fairly unique, and type 4, 5, and 6 are variants of type 3. Type 1, the clavicle is not elevated with respect to the acromion. The key feature is a mild sprain of the AC ligament. Type 2, the clavicle is elevated but not above the superior border of the acromion. The key feature is a rupture of the AC ligament and joint capsule. The deltoid and trapezius muscles are minimally detached. Type 3, the clavicle is elevated above the superior border of the acromion, but the coracoclavicular distance is less than twice the normal. The key feature is a rupture of the AC ligament, coracoclavicular ligament, and the joint capsule. The deltoid and trapezius are minimally detached. A type 4, the clavicle is displaced posteriorly into the trapezius. A type 5, the clavicle is markedly elevated and coracoclavicular distance is more than double normal, which is greater than 25 millimeters. In type 6, the clavicle inferiorly displaces behind the coracobrachialis and biceps tendons, which is very rare. A shoulder sprain is damage to the shoulder ligaments or capsule which support the glenohumeral and shoulder joint. This may be stretching of the fibers or partial to full tears of the ligaments or joint capsule. A sprained shoulder is caused by a force on the arm which stretches the shoulder ligaments. Usually this involves the arm being forced backwards when it is raised to 90 degrees at the shoulder. This causes stretching or tearing of the ligaments or capsule at the front of the shoulder. 
This is not a particularly common injury as the ligaments of the shoulder are very strong. Also, the muscles at the front of the shoulder, such as the pectoralis, are more likely to be injured first. Shoulder sprain symptoms will vary depending on how bad the injury is and can range from mild to severe. Typically, they include pain at the shoulder, usually in the front of the joint. There will be tenderness when pressing in the area of injury. Rapid swelling may appear and the shoulder may be painful to move. Severe shoulder sprains may result in instability of the shoulder joint. Rest the arm. A sling may be useful to help take the weight off the shoulder. Apply ice or cold therapy products to ease pain, bleeding, swelling, and inflammation. See a sports injury specialist who can assess the injury. A dislocated shoulder is a traumatic or painful injury often caused in contact sports or from a fall. The upper arm bones dislocate out of its normal position with significant damage to the surrounding tissue, including muscle, tendon, and ligaments. Shoulder dislocations occur when the head of the humerus bone pops out of the shoulder joint. They are usually either posterior, where the head of the humerus or upper arm dislocates out of the back of the joint, or more commonly anterior, where it pops out forward. In most cases, the top of the arm bone is forced forwards and then the arm is held to the side and turned outward. Posterior dislocations account for around 3% of shoulder dislocations and can occur during epileptic seizures or when falling onto an outstretched hand. The shoulder joint is particularly prone to injury during the large amount of motion available, which sacrifices stability. Most shoulder dislocations also cause tears to the glenoid labrum, which is a ring of cartilage which acts as a cup in which the humerus bone rests. There is likely to be damage to the surrounding ligaments, tendons, nerves, blood vessels, and possible fracture to other bones. Recurrent injuries can be common, which is especially why it's important that significant shoulder rehabilitation is done. Dislocated shoulders are usually caused by a fall onto an outstretched arm, twisting or impact of the shoulder. Sudden severe pain will be felt at the time of injury, along with swelling, bruising, which develops typically later. The patient may feel the shoulder pops out of the joint and the injured side will often look different or possibly lower than the uninjured side. The patient will usually hold the arm close to the body and resist moving or turning it outwards. If there is any nerve or blood vessel damage, there may be also a pins and needles or numbness or discoloration to the arm and hand. Immediate treatment for dislocated shoulders has two stages. First, to protect the shoulder joint and prevent further damage, and second, to seek medical attention as soon as possible. First-time dislocations should always be considered for fracture and possible labral tear. In addition, possible nerve and vascular damage is common. Check the distal pulse and make sure that rehabilitation includes shoulder strengthening exercises because a high rate of occurrence is likely with shoulder dislocations. Shoulder instability means that the shoulder joint is too loose and is able to slide around too much in the socket. In some cases, the unstable shoulder actually slips out of the socket. If the shoulder slips completely out of the socket, it can become dislocated. If not treated, instability can lead to arthritis of the shoulder. Shoulder instability often follows an injury that causes the shoulder to dislocate. This injury is usually fairly significant and the shoulder must be reduced. To reduce the shoulder means it must be manually put back into the socket. The shoulder may seem to return to normal, but the joint often remains unstable. The ligaments that hold the shoulder in the socket, along with the labrum, may have become stretched or torn. This makes them too loose to keep the shoulder in the socket when it moves in certain positions. An unstable shoulder can result in repeated episodes of dislocations, even during normal activities, such as sleeping. Instability can also follow less severe shoulder injuries. Common signs and symptoms include chronic popping or clicking, chronic pain, and they may develop more problems such as shoulder impingement syndrome. Management can either be conservative or surgical depending on the amount of joint instability that is associated with the injury. Rotator cuff strengthening exercises can also assist with stabilizing the shoulder joint. There are two types of flexibility. Hyperflexibility is different than traumatic instability. Joint hypermobility means that some or all of the person's joints have an unusually large range of movement. People with hypermobile joints are particularly supple and able to move their limbs into positions that others would find impossible. Joint hypermobility is what some people refer to as having loose joints or being double jointed. In some cases, traumatic instability can happen without a previous dislocation. 
People who do repetitive motions may gradually stretch out a joint capsule. This is especially common in athletes such as baseball pitchers, volleyball players, and swimmers. The glenoid labrum is a fibrous ring of tissue which attaches to the rim of the glenoid shallow hole or socket of the shoulder blade where the ball of the humerus or arm bone sits. The glenoid labrum is a fibrous ring of tissue which deepens the shallow depression of the scapula and shoulder blade. The glenoid labrum increases the depth of the shoulder cavity making the joint more stable. The glenohumeral ligaments then secure the upper arm to the shoulder and the shoulder capsule attaches to the glenoid labrum. The glenoid labrum is often injured by repetitive overhead throwing, lifting, or catching heavy objects below the shoulder height or falling onto an outstretched arm. Symptoms include shoulder pain, which cannot be localized to a specific point. Pain is made worse by overhead activities or when the arm is held behind the back. Patients may experience weakness or instability in the shoulder with specific tenderness over the front of the shoulder. Pain may be reproduced on resisted flexion of the biceps or bending of the elbow against resistance. Injuries are classified as either superior or towards the top of the glenoid socket or inferior towards the bottom of the glenoid socket. A superior injury is known as a slap lesion, superior labrum, anterior to posterior. It is a tear of the rim above the middle of the socket that may also involve the bicep tendon. A tear of the rim below the middle of the glenoid socket is called a Bankart lesion and also involves the inferior glenohumeral ligament. Tears of the glenoid labrum may often occur with other shoulder injuries, such as a dislocated shoulder. For glenoid labrum tears, the management includes rest and applying cold therapy to reduce pain and inflammation. NSAIDs may be used to help with pain modulation as well. Unstable injuries will require surgery to reattach the labrum to the glenoid. Bankart lesions will require surgery, as will slap lesions. Any underlying cause which has contributed to the injury, such as shoulder instability, should also be addressed during surgery. Following surgery, the shoulder will usually be kept in a sling for three to four weeks. After six weeks, more specific sports training can be done, although full fitness may take three to four months to return. Shoulder impingement syndrome is a common cause of shoulder pain. It occurs when there is an impingement or pinching of the tendons or bursa in the shoulder from the bones of the shoulder. Overhead activities of the shoulder, especially repetitive activity, is a risk factor for shoulder impingement syndrome. Examples include painting, lifting, swimming, tennis, and other overhead sports. Other risk factors include bone and joint abnormalities. With impingement syndrome, pain is persistent and affects everyday activities. Motions such as reaching up behind the back or reaching over the head to put on a coat or blouse, for example, may cause pain. Over time, impingement syndrome can lead to inflammation of the rotator cuff tendons or the bursa. If not treated appropriately, the rotator cuff tendons can start to thin and tear. Primary impingement is due to mechanical compression due to abnormalities in the structure of the joint. These abnormalities could include acromium shapes, either normal versus hooked, thickened tendons, enlarged bursa, or abnormal posture. Secondary impingement is due to shoulder instability and rotator cuff weakness, not a structural issue. The typical signs and symptoms of impingement syndrome include difficulty reaching up behind the back, pain with overhead use of the arm is common, especially in what's called the painful arc. The typical signs and symptoms of impingement syndrome include difficulty reaching up behind the back, pain with overhead use of the arm, which is commonly referred to as painful arc, and weakness of shoulder muscles. If tendons are injured for a long period of time, the tendon can actually tear in two, resulting in a rotator cuff tear. This causes significant weakness and may make it difficult for the person to elevate his or her arm. Some people can have a rupture in their bicep muscle as a part of this continuing impingement process. The management of shoulder impingement syndromes include restoration of normal biomechanical movement, possible surgery to remove an abnormally shaped acromion process, rotator cuff strengthening exercises, price, and NSAIDs. The rotator cuff is a group of muscles and tendons that surrounds the shoulder joint, keeping the head of your upper arm bone firmly within the shallow socket of the shoulder. A rotator cuff injury can cause a dull ache in the shoulder, which often worsens when you try to sleep on the involved side. 
rotator cuff injuries occur most often in people who repetitively perform overhead motions in their jobs or sports. Examples include painters, carpenters, and people who play baseball, tennis, or volleyball. The risk of rotator cuff injury also increases with age. Many people recover from rotator cuff disease with physical therapy exercises that improve flexibility and strength of the muscles surrounding the shoulder joint. Sometimes rotator cuff tears may occur as a result of a single injury. In those circumstances, medical care should be provided as soon as possible. Extensive rotator cuff tears may require surgical repair, transfer of alternative tendons, or a joint replacement. A rotator cuff injury can be painful and reduce the amount of range of motion. The pain associated with rotator cuff injury may be described as a dull, achy pain in the shoulder, disturb sleep, particularly if you lie on the affected shoulder, make it difficult for you to comb or wash your hair or reach behind your back, and may be accompanied by arm weakness. Price and NSAIDs could help with pain management. Physical therapy exercises can help restore the flexibility and strength to the shoulder after rotator cuff injury. Sometimes it is possible to eliminate pain and restore function without surgery. Many different types of surgeries are available for rotator cuff injuries, including arthroscopic tendon repair, open tendon repair, bone spur removal, tendon transfer, and shoulder replacement. Biceps tendon, tendonitis, tendinopathy, tendinosis, tenosynovitis are all common terms that describe pain or injury to one of, of your shoulder's bicep tendons. Bicep tendinopathy is the umbrella term for bicep injuries that include biceps tendinitis, tendinosis, tenosynovitis, and rupture of the biceps tendon. Tendinitis is from an inflamed tendon. Tendinosis is a non-inflamed degenerative tendon. Tenosynovitis is inflammation of the tendon sheath. And a rupture of the bicep tendon is typically secondary to a general degeneration or tear. Biceps tendinopathy is rarely seen in isolation. It is caused by overuse, tendon impingement, shoulder joint instability, or trauma. Therefore, it coexists with a lot of other pathologies of the shoulder, including rotator cuff impingement syndrome, rotator cuff tears, labral tears, slap lesions, and shoulder instability. It is common in sports that involve throwing, swimmers, gymnasts, and some contact sports. Occupations that involve overhead shoulder work or heavy lifting are at risk as well. Biceps tendonitis and tendinopathy sufferers will commonly report pain in the region of the anterior shoulder located over the bicipital groove, occasionally with radiating pain down to the elbow. Overhead activities usually reproduce pain, especially in those positions that combine abduction and external rotation. Examples are cocking to throw. The pain is often aggravated by shoulder flexion, forearm supination, or elbow flexion. Some patients describe muscle weakness and clicking or snapping with shoulder movements. The symptoms are typically alleviated by rest and ice. The biceps muscle is a large muscle in the front of your arm. The biceps muscle is the muscle most flexed by strongmen in demonstrating their muscles. The biceps is attached at the top of the shoulder and then below the elbow to the radius bone by a strong tendon. This strong tendon at the elbow can rupture with a very strong contraction of the bicep muscle. It can also rupture from the shoulder. People may feel a pop in the elbow or the shoulder, and this usually happens when the tendon is already worn and prone to injury. The people most likely to get a biceps tendon rupture are strength athletes, bodybuilders, and heavy manual workers. Generally, they're males over the age of 35 years. Unlike other tendon ruptures, steroid use has not been shown to be involved in the rupture of distal bicep tendons. After the injury, there is usually localized pain in the front of the elbow or shoulder with bruising and swelling. The bicep muscle may retract into the upper arm, creating a prominent bump, also known as Popeye's sign. This is often visibly different than the other biceps when contracting the muscle. A bicep tendon rupture leads to weakness of the elbow and forearm if not repaired. People have difficulty twisting a screwdriver, turning a key, and lifting weights. This is due to a 55% reduction in forearm twisting strength or supination power and a 36% reduction in elbow bending strength or flexion power. Therefore, an early operative repair of the treatment of choice to restore the full strength and correct the deformity is most often chosen. Repair should be undertaken within three weeks of the injury or as soon as possible.
Thoracic outlet syndrome, or TOS, is a syndrome involving compression at the thoracic inlet, which is clinically known as the superior thoracic outlet, resulting from excessive pressure placed on a neurovascular bundle between the anterior scalene or middle scalene muscles. It can affect one or more of the nerves that innervate the upper limb and or the blood vessels as they pass between the chest and the upper extremity, specifically at the brachial plexus, the subclavian artery, and rarely the subclavian vein. Thoracic outlet syndrome may result from a positional cause, for example, by abnormal compression of the clavicle or collarbone and the shoulder girdle on arm movement. There are also several static forms caused by abnormalities, enlargements, or spasms of the various muscles surrounding the arteries, veins, and or the brachial plexus, a fixation of the first rib, or a cervical rib. The most common cause of thoracic outlet syndrome includes a physical trauma from a car accident, repetitive strain injury from a job such as a frequent non-ergonomic use of a keyboard, sports-related activities, and anatomical defects such as having an extra rib. An extra incomplete rib is present in approximately less than 0.2% of the population. Painful thoracic outlet syndrome can be attributed to one or more of the following factors, congenital abnormalities, including a cervical rib, prolonged transverse processes, and muscular abnormalities or fibrous connective tissue abnormalities. Trauma-like whiplash or repetitive strain is frequently implicated. Thoracic outlet syndrome affects mainly the upper limbs with signs and symptoms manifesting in the shoulder, neck, arms, and hands. Pain can be present on an intermediate or permanent basis. It can be sharp, stabbing, burning, or aching. Thoracic outlet syndrome can involve only part of the hand, as in the fourth or fifth finger only, all of the hand, or the inner aspect of the forearm and arm. Pain can also exhibit on the side of the neck, the pectoral area below the clavicle, the armpit or axillary area, and the upper back. Discoloration of the hands, one hand being colder than the other, weakness of the hand and arm muscles, and tingling are commonly present. Stretching, acupuncture, chiropractic adjustments, and occupational or physical therapy are common non-invasive approaches used in the treatment of thoracic outlet syndrome. It is vital to immediately refer patients to get an assessment of the vascular involvement to determine proper therapy. A winging scapula is a common symptom of another condition, rather than an injury itself. It is where the shoulder blade protrudes out on the back rather than laying flat against the back of the chest wall. Patients can complain of shoulder blade pain with pressure on the scapula from a chair when sitting. If caused by an injury resulting in nerve damage, the patient may have limited shoulder elevation as well as shoulder blade pain. A winging scapula is also a quite common dysfunction of the shoulder as it is associated with poor posture. It can also be associated with damage or contusion to the long thoracic nerve of the shoulder and or weakness in the serratus anterior muscle. If the long thoracic nerve is damaged or bruised, it can cause paralysis of the serratus anterior muscle and winging of the scapula or shoulder blade. Damage to the nerve can be caused by contusion or by a blunt trauma to the shoulder, traction of the neck, and can also follow sometimes a viral illness. A full rehabilitation and strengthening program consisting of winging scapular exercises as well as a range of other exercises for the shoulder is important. The most important muscle to strengthen is the serratus anterior muscle, which holds the shoulder blade in place.